One day I'm standing in line at the dollar store when a blonde haired little white girl who looked to be about five years old flashed me a toothless smile. Hello, she said. Then with a quizzical look and her head cocked to the side, she said to me, you have a black face. <laughs> now, rarely am I rendered speechless, but admittedly in that moment, I didn't know what to say to that little girl. As I searched my mind for an adequate response, I noticed that the two white people behind me were laughing nervously. The cashier was visibly shaken. Her voice, her face turned red. Her hands trembled as she scanned the girl's items. I thought to myself, why are they reacting like this? What do they think I'm going to say or do to this little girl? Finally, I said to the girl, well, yes, I do have a black face. And she said, well, how did you get that black face? And I simply said, well, I was born with it, just like you were born with your white face. And she said, oh, and then she ran off. This little girl had no way of knowing the complexity and the nuances of her otherwise simple observation of my black face. This girl wasn't blinded by my black skin because she had never seen me before. The white people behind me and the white cashier were nervous and visibly shaken because they had seen me before. Because as adults, they were fully aware of the prejudices and the negative stereotypes that are attached to my black skin. So I ask you, do you see me? Or is your vision obscured by stereotypes that are attached to my black skin? It's been 15, 14 years since my interaction with that little girl. But in many regards, I have met her multiple times during my career as a black woman professor navigating the white spaces of the ivory tower of academia, often coming into contact with people who are also shocked to see my black face when I walk into the classroom or enter other spaces where I, where I am presumed to not belong. My name is Dr. Bria Willingham. I am an educator. I am a scholar. I am a journal editor. I am an advocate for people impacted by the injustice system. I am a daughter. I am a sister. I am an aunt. I am a friend. I am many things, but above all else, and before I am anything else, I am a Black woman. Tonight, I want to talk to you about what it means for Black women to be seen. Because if you are to have 2020 vision, whether it's hindsight or you're looking forward, you will not be able to see anything clearly or fully if you do not see and acknowledge Black women. Now, full disclosure, framing this conversation about acknowledging the existence and the humanity of Black women was a frustrating and daunting task for me because it's a conversation that I have had several times before in different arenas, and it's a conversation that I'm pretty sure I will need to continue to have. But the fact that I need to continue to have this conversation is a problem because it says that Black women are still not being seen, still not being heard, or otherwise acknowledged. Now, what do I mean when I say to be seen? Well, simply put, to be seen means a validation of one's existence. For instance, when my friends and I say, I see you, sis. It's an affirmation of love and Black pride because we not only recognize each other's accomplishments, but we know and we feel the struggles behind reaching those accomplishments. We understand the adept skill it takes to tiptoe on the fragile tightrope that is code switching, simultaneously existing and not existing in white spaces that are not designed for us and in a, and in a society that is hell-bent on continuing to denigrate us. I see you, sis, even if nobody else does. This simultaneous existing and not existing helps to create a hyper invisibility of black women that is fueled primarily by decentering our experiences. Too often the power of black women is only acknowledged when we are needed to fill gaps on committees, when we are needed to win elections and make history. As Abby Phillips so eloquently reminded us this election season, black women did that. Too often, Black women are only seen when white people are stealing our intellectual prowess or pretending to be us in academic spaces. <laughs> the hyper-invisibility of Black women is blatantly obvious in the criminal injustice system where we are overrepresented. 
the imprisonment rate of black women is 1.7 times the rate of imprisonment for white women. Nearly half of black women in the United States, including myself, has an incarcerated relative. And as highlighted in the research of Evelyn Patterson, having incarcerated relatives negatively impacts black women's mental health. So you see, despite our sustained sustained presence in this system, either as incarcerated um, individuals or in some other capacity where we are negatively impacted by this system, Black women are often excluded from discourses about criminal justice, even though they are the discussion. As one way to counter this exclusion, I and two of my colleagues, Dr. Erin Corbett and Dr. Bahia Muhammad, created the Jami Sisterhood to center the experiences of Black women in higher education in prison. To put it bluntly, in a field that is overwhelmingly white, we grew sick and tired of begging for a seat at the table. So we decided to build our own table. We decided to build our own chairs. We decided to create a safe space for Black women who are working in this field. Within six months, we gained our LLC license and hosted five webinars on the varied ways Black women are impacted by the criminal injustice system. Centering Black women's experiences means changing the narratives that are written about us, but not by us. You see, we, we will remain invisible if we don't rewrite the narratives that other people have written for us. I was reminded recently how hyper-invisibility shows up for me in my work. I had a rather jarring epiphany of sorts last week while I was preparing my remarks for this talk. I was sitting at my desk when I heard a voice say, do you see yourself? I looked around <laughs> to see who said that. Of course, nobody was there, but this phantom voice has forced me to engage in some deep self-reflection about my own invisibility, particularly because I am surrounded by whiteness. I often say that my daily life is so whitewashed because I live in a predominantly white town. I teach at a predominantly white institution where I find myself fighting against negative stereotypes and tropes of what it means to be a black woman, all the while being authentically and unapologetically black. Performing this balancing act sometimes feels like I am invisible to myself. But it also means I am hyper visible as I maneuver these white spaces because being a black woman working in academia and in carceral spaces means that I defy each system. It means I defy the higher education system that was not designed for me. And I defy the prison system that was designed to enslave me. You see, simply by showing up, I am decolonizing these spaces. Simply by showing up, I am defying these spaces. Another example, during my research three years ago about black women in police violence, I found myself over identifying with the stories of black women being brutalized and killed by police. Not because I myself has been, have been a victim of police violence, but because I am fully aware that my PhD does not protect me from potentially becoming a hashtag. Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man said, I am visible simply because people refuse to see me. For Black women, I take that a step further to say we are often relegated to a social standing past invisible to that of non-existent. Breonna Taylor's death is a tragic reminder. A, ba a Black woman killed while asleep in her own home. A white, now ex-cop, indicted on three counts of wanton endangerment for shooting into the home of Brianna's neighbor, not for killing Brianna, not even for endangering her life. It's as if she didn't exist. In her essay, The Task of Negro Womanhood, Elise Johnson McDougall writes that black women are, quote, figuratively struck in the face daily by contempt from the world about her. But through it all, she is courageously standing erect developing within herself the moral strength to rise above and conquer false attitudes, end quote. Black women are powerful. Black women are beautiful. Black women are lit. Do you see me now? The little white girl I met in the dollar store 14 years ago, 
should be a young woman by now, presumably with more life experience. You know, but I wonder if she and I were to meet again today, would she be blinded by my black skin or would she see me? Thank you.